Okay, cool. All right, I'm going to get started now. Um, sorry about being able to see my entire computer. I can't get that to go full screen without going black over here. So, um, and I need to be able to see my notes. So, um, I need to get back there. That's better. Okay, my name's Josh Walker. Um, I'm a uh, front-end developer at Kalamuna. Um, I'm also a metalhead. Um, you may notice that I have a strange accent, but um, it's actually you guys that have the accent. I speak very normally. Um, but I need to um, say if there's anything that I say that's weird or you don't understand, just like let me know because even after living in Canada for six years, I still find myself saying things and people like don't really understand what I'm saying. Um, so yeah. Um, I have uh, been working with Drupal for almost nine years and um, in the last uh, few years I've been concentrating um, on specifically front-end development. Um, uh, but I also have a, a background in graphic design as well, and film and television as well, so um, that's me. Um, a little bit about Kalamuna. Um, Kalamuna is a uh, web development shop based out of Oakland in California. Um, we have our uh, trusted uh, leader here with us today, Andrew, um, supporting me. And uh, we like to work mainly with uh, mission-driven organizations, um, not-for-profits, higher ed, um, that, that sort of thing. And we are, um, we're a partially distributed team. There's a bunch of people in the office down in Oakland. And then there's three of us in Canada, and then we've got... Um, people spread out in America and then one over in Europe as well, so that's us. Um, here's some of our clients. Um, so you can see, yeah, there's a lot of, lot of higher ed there. Um, and that's pretty much who, the kinds of people that we work for and the kinds of the, the size of the projects that we're working on. Oops, sorry about that. Okay, um, so today I'm gonna, I want to talk to you about um, design-driven development. This is something that we've been working on um, over the past few years to try and kind of flip the table on, tradi on traditional workflows uh, when it comes to development. Um, if you think about the, the normal life cycle of a project after the discovery and um, the design phase has happened, um, generally, you know, you get your back-end developers come in, someone's working out an information architecture um, so that they can build out the content types, the entity types, the fields in Drupal. They go away, they build that, and then once they're done with that, it's then the FEMA's job to try and somehow nail the design onto what Drupal is spitting out. Um, this is just this is the way we've approached it for years, um, but but you know there's there's some inherent problems in in that, um, and what we wanted to do is try and have the design be the thing that is that is informing um, what Drupal looks like and the actual HTML, um, the markup, the CSS. Um, so I'm gonna like. Pull, pull apart our workflow a little bit and show you how we've um, been, ab been able to do that. Um, if you think about, um, you, you hire a front-end developer because they're good at HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. You hire a back-end developer because they know Drupal's APIs, they know database abstraction layers and, and all that boring stuff. Um, but, <laughs> um, with Drupal, we kind of end up with this kind of in-between job of the FEMA, where they're, they're kind of like, what are they? Are they, are they a, a back-end developer? Are they a front-end developer? Like, they need to know, they need to kind of ride that middle ground, and, and in some ways they're a bit of a unicorn because there's, there's not a lot of people that, that, are, that are really good at both things. Um, so in, in, a, in a way, we're trying to empower front-end designers, uh, developers to do what they do best, and, and leave the back-end developers to do what they do best and try and limit the amount of crossover that happens in, in that space. Uh, <clears throat> um, so the thing that we use um, to... The, the, the main people that, that are involved in, in this process 
um, are these people here. Rob Loach, who is probably the most Drupal famous Canadian. Um, myself, Tiago, who is a designer and front-end developer. Derek DeRaps, who's a uh, um, Drupal guru. Um, no, I wrote wizard here. He, he used to be more of a wizard, but he's shaved off his beard now, so um, yeah. And then also Andrew, who is our spiritual leader, guiding us through the rough seas. Um, I spoke on a similar, a similar subject last year with Rob at um, Drupal North in Montreal. Um, so I'm going to be covering some of the same things, but um, lots has changed. Um, in the Drupal world, I feel like we've gone from last year, it was Drupal 7, uh, you know, Drupal 8 was here, um, you know, like we're starting to play with it, but, you know, in terms of like big, um, heavy production sites, it was still kind of not quite ready for prime time. We weren't doing a lot of, uh, I, don't think, I don't know if we'd done any at the time. Um, but so between then and now, um, we've, we've switched over to basically all, all new sites that we're doing in Drupal, Drupal 8 sites um, so far. And um, yeah, so that, that means a lot of different things. And it's, it's opened up a bunch of capabilities because of um, you know, Drupal's adoption of Twig and that sort of thing. So um, lots has changed on, on our end too in, in, um, in Cal Static, the, the framework that, we're, that I'm going to be talking about. Um, because we no longer have to deal with uh, Drupal 7 as a, as a thing. Um, okay, so just quickly, um, why prototype? Um, prototyping is, is definitely something that, uh, you know, probably doesn't happen as often on smaller projects. So the kinds of projects that we're working on, um, you know, it definitely, that, that can dictate to the fact that, that we're prototyping. Um, but but the, the, main, the main crux of it, when you're building a, a large site, um, we want to minimize risk because we don't want to, we don't want to go down a rabbit hole, you know, and end up having to backtrack. You know, we, we, want, to, we want to be able to like prove our work um, and minimize the risk before, before, uh, before we get too far down, down the uh, development road. I'm sure if any of you are uh, uh, back-end developers, you know, you've, probably had, you've probably had situations where you thought you knew what needed to be done and you did it and you've nailed everything to the floor and then you realize oh, it would have been better if we did it like this because of some uh, other requirement that you, that you weren't thinking about or a new requirement or something like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, you can, you can waste a lot of time on, on that sort of thing. Um, so, um, when, you're using, when you're using static um, content files in a prototype, you don't have to wait for the CMS to be set up um, to start entering content, um, which, is, which is great also not only um, for building, building stuff out with real content, but it's also helpful for uh, actually proofing your content because content content needs to be user tested and, and, and iterated over as in, in the same way that our development does as well. Um, so being able to explore design ideas um, without it affecting the build um, is also a useful thing. Um, most of you are probably familiar with agile um, development methodolo methodology. Um, you know, the idea of, of, you know, like doing what you can in a sprint and then iterating um, it, it can, you know, we, we like to apply that to the design process as well, you know, so that we're, we're um, you know, getting user feedback early and, and iterating on that feedback and, and constantly improving. Uh, and, and with a prototype, you can do that before committing to the actual whole build. Um, this is another big advantage um, with the way that we work is that front-end and back-end um, can happen ahead or simultaneously to the, to the, uh, to the back-end. Um, so that helps to be able to you know, like work at the same time, save time in terms of timelines, if the front-end people can be working on the same component as the back-end people, you know, and hopefully they converge in the middle rather than having to wait until it's already built out in Drupal.
I think it's crashed. What's going on? Oh, uh, we covered that. Okay. So this is kind of like a diagram of our workflow. Um, so over here, um, initially we've got the um, you know the discovery uh, that happens, and then the result of that we end up with uh, design comps and style tiles. Sometimes both, sometimes one or the other. And so as soon as we as soon as we have that uh, as soon as we have that stuff, the front end developers can get start working on the components of the design, um, and they can start building the HTML, the CSS the JavaScript that's required to, to build out um, the comps. Um, they're doing that with the CSS and the Twig. Layouts is all part of that. Um, and then at the same time, we've got the, the Drupal developers up here building out their uh, building out site, site building and you know, also any custom code that needs to happen. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's what it looks like. Um, and then this one is, is kind of like, between me and Tiago, we kind of like call this the holy grail because we're, you know, like, um, Tiago's a designer. Um, he's, he's not from a Drupal background. He's been working with Drupal for a while. But we, we love the idea um, of, and I think Pierre was talking about this um, just in, at the end of the last session, um, the idea that you can that your front end is agnostic from your back end. You can be building out the styles and the twig templates from a, from a design. Yes, we're going to use it in Drupal, but you know what else are we? Gonna, what else could we use it in? If you think about like a large organisation that um, that has different platforms across different departments or whatever, you know that this, something like this can enable them to to you know, one department to have a Drupal website and then another department to reuse that same twig templates and styling for you know, any, any other, uh, frame, any other like, back-end framework. Um, yeah. Okay, so Calistatic is what we call our front-end framework. Um, essentially, um, it is a prototyping framework um, it generates static sites um, and it supports Markdown and JSON um, to, for the content. It is also a living style guide in the same way that you're probably more familiar with something like Pattern Lab. Um, it's a, a similar kind of deal there um, where we're taking, um, it's basically a, just a, a list of um, a configurable list of all the components that you've built out on, uh, that you can use on the site. Um, we don't enforce atomic design, uh, like uh, uh, atomic principles, uh, in the same way that Pattern Lab does. Um, but we agree that it's a good idea, so we so we do use atomic um, uh, principles to like. Um, to group all our components molecular, molecularly, is that a word? Um, but uh, yeah, we, we're, we're, using, we're using that kind of methodology to, to keep things sensible and sane, you know, in your folder structure, um, and then bring, that, bring, them into, bring the components into Drupal's theme layer. Um, and yeah, it, it, in general, it's it's just a it's a solution for lean UX. I don't, if you're familiar, not familiar with lean UX, it's what I was talking about before about an, an agile uh, methodology and uh, an agile approach to to designing and you know, iterating, getting user feedback early so that you can iterate and um, end up with, ultimately end up with a better product. Um, so, um, anyone that's looking to develop prototypes or style guides. Uh, if you like the idea of sharing style guide components, um, the CSS, the JavaScript between a prototype and Drupal's, Drupal's theme layer, um, if you're interested in any sort of decoupling, um, you have a requirement to maintain a mix of CMS and non-CMS pages, um, or just you know rapidly the need to rapidly build out a bunch of components, um, then this could be for you. So we're talking front-end developers code savvy de designers, 
um, any, a back-end dev that ha, you know, is working in collaboration with the front-end dev, um, any in-house teams and agencies. We actually have some exper recent experience um, using Calistatic um, in an inter-agency inter uh, kind of space. Um, and I think it's been successful um, the couple of times that we've done it. Um, so, yeah. It, you know, if you, if you think about, you know, sometimes you get like, if you're a, you know, a, a back-end heavy Drupal shop and, you know, you work with, with, a, with a designer, a different agency that's a designer or front-end developers, then, you know, there's, there's lots of space for, like, collaboration there. Um, what was that? Oh, yes. How it helps. So prototyping in the browser um, and testing early is, is one of the main things that we find is fantastic about it. Um, there's nothing worse than getting through to the end, near the end of a, of a development cycle and having the clients start looking at it and playing with it in the browser and having them go, hmm, this isn't what I, what I thought. Um, this, this isn't quite the same. You know, like looking at a static comp, and they can go, yeah, that's cool, I think that's good. But when they start actually looking at it in a browser, playing with it, resizing their browser, doing all those sorts of things um, that you actually do with a website, there can be problems. So when, you, when you're prototyping, you can address those problems earlier and you've got time to iterate uh, before, before you're really like nailing down the information architecture or you know, building out content types and entity types and fields and stuff. Um, Yeah, the, the, um, having a style guide is great because um, it, it acts as documentation, um, you know, so a lot of our projects um, start off in a big push um, in, uh, to, to build them, and then once they're done, they, they then go off to a support team um, who aren't necessarily always the same people that built the site. Um, so having a style guide is great in, in, in that sort of circumstance to, um, you know, inform those people, if, if a client comes back to you and goes, you know what, I need these three extra components done, um, it's not going to come back as a, it's not a big project, so it's not going to come back to the people that built it, it's going to stay in the support, but those support guys have this style guide that they can base these new components on um, visually and, you know, like, um, programmatically and um, functionally. Um, so that's, uh, that eases things in that sort of a situation. Um, Calistatic um, has um, been. A, we it started development in Drupal seven um, and has and we've now moved on to using it in Drupal eight. Um, we made the decision whilst but before it was Drupal seven, we weren't actually using Twig, but we knew Drupal eight was going to end up with Twig. So we at some point we switched our templating engine to Twig. Um, and so one of the advantages of that, even if you're using Calistatic on a Drupal 7 site, is you know, migration is easy. You can, you can inherit those templates you know, if a migration happens down, down the road. Um, and um, we also wrote a little module called the Twigshin module, which lets you use Twig templates in Drupal 7. Um, and I'll show you that a, a little bit later. Um, but I'm not going to harp on it because like I said, most of the stuff that, that most people are doing now, I think, are eight. So, um, calistatic is calitastic. My wife made me put that in. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. So, what, what about small projects? You know, like not everyone has the budget for the, these big builds with you know, like prototyping and iterating and all this stuff. Um, the cool thing about calistatic is you can build you can build just static websites with it as well. Um, our, our company website, calamuna.com, is built with Calistatic, um, and it's not driven by Drupal at all, um, because it didn't need to be, because Drupal's not the answer to everything. But that's a whole other talk, right? Um, yeah, so you can, you can build out your page one layout at a time. Um, ha using Markdown for content is, is great, um, and you know, you can throw any, you know, we're, we're, we use Bootstrap for a lot of our projects, but there's nothing in Calistatic that is tying you down to using Bootstrap. You can use it uh, in, in combination with any other front-end framework. Um, so 
uh, just really quickly, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the um, principles of atomic design. It's just a way of organizing your, um, your, cont your uh, components um, in a sensible fashion. Um, so you've got small elements like an input or a, or a link or a heading as an atom. Bigger components is a collection, uh, molecule is a collection of atoms and then an organism is a collection of molecules. Um, and then uh, that's just an example from Brad Frost where he's taking the content, sticking in a layout, adding the components and boom, you have a page. Um, so that's the general principle that we, that we stick to. But again, like I said before, there's nothing inherent in calistatic that's enforcing this on you. <clears throat> okay. So now, this is going to be hard. We have to sit down, I think. I just want to show you what it looks like. Because I've talked a lot of uh, theory here. But... Uh, uh, I want to show you in the code editor what it actually looks like. Okay, can you guys see that? Should I zoom in a bit? It's okay? Okay. I tried to go with a light background because it's so everyone can see it. Um, so the, um, the very first thing to look at, um, I didn't mention um, Calistatic is actually a node module. Um, so you can see here we've just added Calistatic to our dependencies. So all you need to do um, is either do that or in the command line, just go, uh, go npm, oops, uh, npm require, oh no, it's not require. Anyway, you know, how, you know how npm works. I've been using Composer too much lately. Um, yeah, so you, you just need to install install that, and um, and that will bring it down for you, and, and you can start using it straight away. Um, basically, um, the the main thing that controls it is this calistatic YAML file. So this is where we set up all the options um, for thing for things that it's going to um, use. You can tell it where it's living, uh, where calistatic is going to live within within your site. We generally stick it in the theme because. At the end of the day, the Drupal theme needs to suck in the JavaScript and CSS, um, so it makes sense. But there's no, there's nothing inherently saying you need it needs to live in your theme. Um, uh, you can you can tell it where it's going to build out to. There's a bunch of different options there um, that uh, more detailed, but um, you know you, you can control how your SAS gets built uh, with Node SAS. Um, Twig namespaces is a is an interesting thing. We've set this up so that so that in our templates we can just reference atoms and it and it will it will uh, know where to look for the templates that you're referencing. Um, and same for molecules, organisms, layouts. Um, the other thing that we've done for Drupal integration is to we've rewritten Drupal's Twig filters. Um, in in JavaScript, so that uh, so that we can use the same filters both in a static in the static prototype as well as in Drupal. So you, you'll notice these are some of the same uh, Twig filters that you can use um, in Drupal. Uh, one note: the trans the translation one doesn't actually work. We like we haven't got that far yet. It's not actually translating anything. It's just returning the string that it was passed. But but it means that that we can use the same templates in Drupal and Calistatic, and it won't throw an error saying it doesn't know about that filter. Um, and then we have uh, set up for KSS, and I'll I'll get into KSS uh, soon because that's that's KSS is what's actually building our style guide for us. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's a bunch of options there. Um, if we dig down into uh, the folder, you can see it's just in themes. I called my theme my theme. That's not confusing at all. Um, and then we just got a calistatic folder there and a source folder inside of it. Um, so let's look at a component. So you can see that we've got them, we've got them laid out, atoms, molecules, organisms, layouts. We've got that extra pages one, which is, which is kind of more of a Drupal thing, because you, you know, sometimes when you have like a views page or something, you, you need to style specifically. But uh, 
<laughs> let's look at. No, let's look at a tout. So, yes, this tout is a single component. So, a single component is made up of a SAS file, a JSON file, and a Twig file. Um, so, you can see this is just a regular Twig file, looks fairly familiar because it's done Drupal 8 development. Um, there's nothing interesting or different about that. Um, the JSON file stores the content uh, that populates the Twig file when we're building out the style guide. Um, and then the CSS, uh, the SAS, is just, it is SAS. The only, the only interesting thing about the way that we do SAS, I think, is um, we use, use the extendable um, extendables to um, define our styles and then apply the extendable to a class. We find this is useful when theming things because it means that we can, uh, especially in a Drupal context, because you know, like we've all experienced like Drupal's awful divs and classes that it spits out. Not so much in eight, it's definitely getting better, but in seven, it's definitely been a problem, you know. And so targeting the right thing here, um, uh, uh, targeting the right, right thing with your CSS has always, has always been really tricky. But here, you know, we can, we can add this, uh, this other tout blah is, is also get styled like this. That's the advantage of using the extendables, so that um, you know we can we can throw this style in any direction that we want. Um, yeah. And then up here we have the the KSS comment. So this is the this comment actually um, KSS passes these comments and actually uses it to build out the style guide. So I will show you what the style guide looks like now. Um, all we got to do is start her up. <laughs> of course. Crap. What does that say? Oh, I'm in the wrong window. Sorry. It's this one. Okay, so um, we have Browser Sync installed in this. So as soon as it starts up, um, Browser Sync uh, starts up and then it automatically pops up a window. Um, which has our prototype in it, uh, which is too big. So let's visit the style guide first. Did I spell that wrong? I can't see. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so this is our style guide, um, and. You can see we have a whole bunch of component, components listed over here. Um, so we'll come in here and let's find the tout that we were looking at. This is this one. So just so you can see, you can match up the, uh, the oh no, we were looking at this one. So you can see these comments get passed and turned into style guide component. Um, and so any, any SAS file that has the KSS in there is going to get um, pulled in and become part of our, uh, out of, out of our style guide. Um, you can click on the markup button and <laughs> it's broken, of course. Oh, there it is. Okay, so so it shows you the markup that's that's being used to generate that that component, and uh, and that's really cool. Um, so there's some other things um, to do with the prototype. Um, let me show you a prototype page. Um, inside this, uh, the inside this folder, so um, the prototype is built with Metalsmith. It looks for these Markdown files, and any any Markdown file, it's going to know that you have 
that's a page you want to generate in, in, the, in the prototype. Um, we just tell it which layout to use, um, give it a title. They, these are arbitrary variables that, get, that will get passed to the page template that's being used to build. And then you can add all sorts of content in here, like just as um, static content there. And so it's going to come, when we, when we run npm, it's going to come into, it's going to find this index.twig, which is here. And you can see all we're doing here is including this component as well as printing out the contents, which will be this, what, you know, any content that's here. Um, the, uh, where is, yeah, so that, that, is, that is how we're generating, oh, where did it go? Go back to the. Okay. Sorry, it's really hard to see the screen from there. Okay, so that's what that's what we're using to um, to generate the prototype. So this is my hero component that I had printing out on the page, um, and then that's the content. That, that we saw before. So other interesting things is um, there is a config which, uh, which lets you set up config for the, for the prototype itself. So you're just telling it where your style sheets are, where your JavaScript is, and you can put JavaScript in both in the header and the footer um, because it is, it's using this uh, page template. Sorry, this HTML.twig, which is going to print all those variables out at the various spots on the page. So that's that's kind of the basics of Calistatic. Um, it's kind of involved, but it's once you get a hang of it, it's super useful and it's very quick at being able to build out lots and lots of components and then you just start, because of the, the power of Twig, being able to just include things on the page, it's very easy to build out big, uh, you know, layouts and lots of different, different pages to build out a prototype. Um, all right, let's go back here. Um, I've lost the present button. <laughs> the internet has died. Awesome. What's going on? Does anyone else get kicked off the Wi Fi? Jeepers. No Wi-Fi. Sorry. You know what? I can do that. Yeah. It only affects front-enders. <laughs> 
It's loading really slow now. Here we go. Because of course I've got like one bar of 3G, so <laughs> sorry about this, guys. Um, okay, where were we? Nope. Okay, back on track. Okay, so most importantly, how do we start using it with Drupal? Okay, the very first thing that, you, that you're going to want to do is install the components module. Um, so the components module um, adds namespaces for um, your Twig for your Twig um, templates. So you saw before where I set up namespaces on the calistatic side. So we had atoms, molecules, um, organisms, and layouts. That's that's for that's for the node side of it. Uh, the component components module lets you do the same thing, but for Drupal. So you define you can define um, Twig namespaces in a theme like your your, your uh, theme info info YAML, um, and so that way you can you can pull in components just by just by saying at atom. You know, and then the name of the of the component. Um, it just it's it's just kind of like syntactic sugar. It's just it enables you to go faster, be less verbose um, when you when you're writing templates. Um, oh yeah. Oh yeah, that, and that's one thing that we yeah that we noted. It's only in a theme file. You, um, Rob has um, submitted a pull request to, to let modules do it as well, but um, that still is outstanding. So um, that's what it looks like. So it's it's easy to find. It's very, it's like very familiar because it's YAM, it's YAML. Um, uh, we'll come back to that. Okay, paragraphs. So you, everyone's probably familiar with paragraphs. Has, has everyone used paragraphs before? Yes. Yeah. Um, if if you're not familiar, it's just a it's just a a, a way to kind of like componentize your content um, on Drupal's back end. Um, but the reason that we use it is because it maps really well to the way that we're componentizing things on the front end. So um, that's really cool. But um, you already said that. Um, okay, what calligraphs? We we started using paragraphs and and initially it was really cool. We liked it. We liked the way things were you know, integrating between the front and the back end. But we found that things started to get really verbose. Uh, we ended up with lots and lots of paragraph types. Um, and when you have lots of paragraph types, it bloats out the, the node edit forms. So you've got these huge lists of different paragraphs that, that um, you needed. Um, also, we found we're ending up with a whole bunch of different fields um, for those paragraphs. But what we noticed was that, that for the most part, most of the components that we were, that we were making paragraphs for had very very similar types of fields. So they often it was a title, a text field, an image field, and a link field. And between those four things, we, we, we could make most of the components that we were trying to make. So Derek went about and decided to write the calligraphs module. Um, Basically, what it does is it is it creates a single paragraph type on your site um, with those four fields set up. Um, so that makes that means there's less bloat in the you know in your database. There's less bloat on your edit forms. Um, but the cool thing is that is that you can you can switch between the uh, different types of components without losing any data. So if 
a content editor in the previous um, iteration um, did up a did up a paragraph with a whole bunch of um, text, added a photo, did all the tweaks that they wanted to do, and then they were like, "Hold on, this was the wrong. This was not what I wanted to do." There was no way for them to convert this paragraph into another type of paragraph. But because we're using a single paragraph on the back end, it's easy for us. It's the, the, the data is the same. It's just what it, it's just the visual look of the component that's changing, right? Um, so that's really cool, and that's something that that the um, clients have found really handy to be able to switch switch between component types. All right. So let me show you what it looks like in Drupal. If I can find my cursor. Okay. So this is Drupal. So you can see we have. Let's go paragraph types. Ignore this subcomponent one for now. That's uh, that's something else. But um, it's it's added this single paragraph type called component. Um, and you can see. Um, it just it automatically makes this paragraph with these fields. Again, ignore the subcomponent thing. Um, we've this is, we've still got a, a bunch of things in development and improvements that we're making, but um, yeah. So that's what it looks like, and that's the, the the kind of the basic entity. So then, if we go to add some content, oh sorry, no, I should show you what the Go to the basic page and show you the fields. So we've added the we've added the the field which references components um, to this content type. Um, uh, I think you can see. Oh, well, I'm not limiting it, but you know you can limit it to just adding the the, the color graph component. Um, so if we go and then we add a, add a page, um, we've got a title like any, any other node, um, but then we get we, here we get we get this list. So we've got a single component that we can add. So we add a component, but then you can see first up, you get to choose which type of component you want to add. Um, but on the back end, all of these have exactly the same fields. So you can see a CTA has all of them, title, text, links, and an image, whereas this callout component, we're hiding most of them because this callout just requires text for that component. But in, in the back end, this text field is all the same. So we've, we've got, uh, we do have subtitle uh, as an extra field sometimes. Um, so that's the, that's the way it works, and, it, and other than that, it, it works exactly the same as, as all, our, all other paragraphs workflows, um, with the added advantage of being able to change what your paragraph looks like based on uh, this display as dropdown. So in the back end, it gets a little bit ugly, but it's getting better really, really soon. So. Currently, the way that you define these um, display types is using a constant in a custom module. So yes, that's very ugly, um, but we're, we're kind of like just getting over a, a, the um, development hump um, to make this um, much more sensible and usable. Um, but you can see here that let's find the CTA tab. So you, uh, you know, it's just an array of, of information. Um, what this is called will actually map to the template that it looks for. So by calling it CTA, uh, tout dash dash CTA, um, color graphs, when it's, when it's outputting the, the view for the, um, for the uh, paragraph, it is going to look for tout dash dash CTA dot HTML dot twig. And because we set up the namespaces with the components, um, Drupal, Drupal knows about this and um, it will find it. So then, uh, oh sorry, you have to specify this path too as, as part of that because it lives inside the molecules, but other, other, um, but other than that it will find it. And then here's just where you define which of those fields that you, re that you need on that paragraph. So the future will involve 
uh, us being able to define this information inside of this component in in the theme. So the, the you know in here we'll either add it to the JSON. We're still trying to work out um, which way to go. We'll either add it to the JSON array um, as a special um, a special item in that array, or add it as a YAML file, which will make it probably a bit more Drupal e if it's a YAML file. Um, but but that gives that gives us a way to define the the content structure and what fields are going to end up on that on that um, component um, without a back-end developer having to do anything and you know when a when a front-end developer is coming here and they're building their twig template based on their designs they already know what variables are going to get stuck where so so we already know that information but um so they can just they can just annotate that in another file in there then there's even less work for a developer to do to come to come along as soon as you as soon as you save that information um, refresh the page. You don't even need to clear the cache. Uh, cache, sorry, that's my that, that's me being Australian again. Uh, you don't even need to clear the cache, um, and it will turn up uh, if you added a new one. It would turn up in this list as a as a new component that you can add. And it's autom You know, as soon as you save the node, it's going to get it's going to get styled. So let's uh, let's. I feel like um, testifying. So. <clears throat> things, things, things. Um, let's find a really bad photo of me. I don't know why I have like these terrible photos sitting of me and sitting on my desktop. Um, gosh, had to do. And then we'll save it. And you can see there it is on the page, styled in the same way you will see if we go back to the style guide. <clears throat> we'll find the testimonial component in here somewhere. Testimonial. And you can see that it's, it's styled the same way because it's sharing exactly the same twig template CSS. So that's kind of it. That's that's the, the kind of like magic source. Um, like I said before, we're you know like we're trying to ease the um, ease the gap and the friction between the front end and the back end. We want to let front end developers do what they do best. Um, we want to we want to let the back end develop, developers do what they do best and and try not to like have too much of that middle theming ground where, you know, where there's just kind of like, whose job is it? <laughs> um, and who's good at it? Um, the last thing I will throw in as, what's the time? Are we getting close? Oh, we are getting close. Um, the last thing that I'll throw in as a bonus But what about Drupal 7? Um, this might be interesting for some people. Um, yes, we worked out a really easy and simple way to use Twig in Drupal 7 and, and without adding any sort of overhead basically at all um, in terms of like rendering time. Um, Derek wrote the Twig Shim module. And basically what it does, you install like Composer like with a via composer with uh, like with you know, Ultra Plate. Um, the main thing that it does is it defines this Twig Shim render um, function, which takes um, a path to a template and takes a set of variables, which is the content that's going to be popular that's gonna, you're going to you're going to populate the template with, um, and you end up using it like this. So you can override a theme hook. So this is like a, for a single a theme hook for a single search result. You can see. Um, and all we're doing is we're set, we're telling uh, which template to use, and then we're just pulling, we're just pulling the, the actual data out of the variables that are being passed into the theme function, and then returning Twitch and render. And all Twitch, because at the end of the day, a theme function just returns markup. Like 
um, if you look at any Drupal theme function in 7, all it's doing is returning a string of markup. And that's all Twig does too. It just returns a string of markup populated with all the, all the variables populated with the content. So um, you, can, you can do this sort of thing. And um, oh, there, yeah, there's an example of the, uh, of the actual template itself. So it, you know, it's just vanilla Twig. Um, and then the, the, uh, the end result is Twig templates in Drupal 7. So that could be handy for someone, I don't know. But um, we found it really useful while, you know, in the, in, you know, before we started really heavy Drupal, uh, Drupal 8 development. And that's it. Everything that we do is open source. So if you guys find this interesting, please talk to us, contribute. Um, there's Calistatic on GitHub. Um, Calligraphs module is really close to being published on Drupal.org. We just want to get over that last hump of getting rid of that big constant array because that's ugly. Um, and, and, and we want to make it more useful uh, for regular folk. And uh, yeah, talk to us about it. Hit us up on the GitHub if you're interested. Um, and, and let us know what's cooking. That's it. <laughs> Any questions? We got two minutes. Yes. So just to be certain, it's static. So there's nothing in the database except for the content that the new show is here. We yeah. strip out the content. We're able to share it between front end devs. And we're good. Yeah. Yeah. There's. Yeah. It's just Twig files and SAS and JavaScript. I didn't really show you show you the JavaScript, but we um, we you know like we we would like to get to a point where we where each component has its own JavaScript file potentially. You know if there's a, if that component has its own JavaScript and you know like we 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 have a way in Calistatic to concatenate for it to just look through all the JavaScript files and concatenate them all into a bigger JavaScript file. Um, and we also have a little trick to, uh, to write our JavaScript on the static side using behaviors so that it's compatible with Drupal. So it's just a matter of like defining you know, the behaviors object and then calling it after your, your own JavaScript is, is, has been run. Um, but yeah, there's little tricks like that to you know, just make it easier to work with Drupal. But yeah, that's it. No one else? Cool, thanks guys.